Good morning and welcome to the Ninja Chickens channel. I hope uh, this video finds you all doing really well. It is early on Friday morning, the 27th. I don't even know what date it is. <laughs> I know it's Friday, I'm not sure the date. Um, it's late July. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm recording now because we're supposed to have some big thunderstorms this afternoon, which would be wonderful because it's been a little dry this past week. Um, and my son is still sleeping. So I may have to stop because, I mean, it's like 8.30, so he should be getting up any time. But he had a hard time sleeping last night. We all had a hard time sleeping last night. Um, it seems like when the weather gets hot and muggy, we don't have air conditioning. The house stays pretty cool, but when the weather gets hot and muggy, you know, it's just not as, not as easy to sleep. But it's cool this morning with the rain coming. I know it's going to cool things off. So welcome. <laughs> it's nice to have you here again. I appreciate you, always appreciate you coming out and checking out my podcast, video, vlog, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, my name is Maria. You can find me on Instagram as ninja.chickens. You can find me on Ravelry as Ninja Chickens. Um, you can find all the show notes in the Ninja Chickens Ravelry group or on ninjachickens.org. This is a video mostly about fibery related things. Um, Although there's definitely going to be a lot of plant-related things thrown in because of all the botanical printing I've been doing lately. Um, and there's some homesteading and homeschooling too. So I hope you enjoy what you hear. Um, I always love it when you leave comments and say hello, so feel free to do so. Um, let's see. I think we'll just start right off. Uh, I have no finished objects for you. No fitted finished knitted objects for you. Um, I have a lot of works in progress and I put a lot of time into them. These past couple of weeks since I've seen you last, um, for one week both my kids were at camp and for the second week, this past week right now, my daughter was at camp and my son was home. Um, so I had a lot of time. It's funny when, when I register them for camp, I think, oh, it's going to be so relaxing. I'll have a break. I'll just put my feet up and eat bonbons. <laughs> um, well, I planned on doing a little bit of botanical printing and ended up spending two full days, 14 to 16 hour days, just doing that. And it, it was awesome. I loved it because it doesn't feel like work to me. It's so much fun to, to play with the plants and unwrap them and see these presents and how beautiful they are. But, um, but you know, at the end of the day, you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. So by the end of the week, because I did that for two full days and then a couple of days here and there, um, doing little things, unwrapping, putting, taking pictures, stuff like that by the end of my week off, I was exhausted. <laughs> so um, I tried to relax a little bit this week. Leaf wasn't feeling great after he came home from camp. So he and I chilled out a bunch and listened to some books on CD. Um, the chickens are saying good morning, by the way. I realize with my new setup, you don't, don't have a whole lot of space to see the cats run by. So I apologize to those of you who like seeing the cats playing in the background. I'm sure they will come out at some point. Um, anyway, in that time that I was, that my kids were at camp, I was also trying to get some knitting time in, especially during the heat of the day. I do my dyeing outside. And so, um, you know, by the time 11 o'clock came around, it was sweltering. So I'd go inside and I'd chill out for a little bit and do some knitting until it cooled off again. So what I've been doing, actually, this isn't knitting, this is crocheting. I've been working on my uh, Granny Stripe Blanket by Attic 24, and I got a lot of work done on it. It's so fast. Crocheting is so fast. I get it, you guys. I know I'm only learning really one stitch here, but I put a little marker in where I was last time, if you can see it down here. That's how much I've done since the last two weeks. Let's see if I can hold it up better. Isn't that fun? So every um, fourth stripe is a stripe from my 20 colors, the 20 colors with matter dyeing class that I went to a couple of years ago at SAF, the Southern, um, Southeastern Animal and Fiber Fair. I always forget if it's Southern Appalachian or Southeastern Animal, but it's called SAF. It's right like 30 minutes from my house. And so we did a dye class and, um, I took a dye class. I didn't teach the dye class. So I've got one, two, three, four of those colors in 
but there's a lot of other that are others that are naturally dyed or undyed also this one was done with black beans this one was also done with matter um there's another one in here i think that was done with matter or cochineal but yeah i'm having fun with this i really like how it's turning out i'm trying to do two back and forth two stripes with each color but sometimes it falls a little short so i'm adding in another little bit of something similar because some i just don't have enough and I want to try and use up as much of my sash as I can. So I'm either doing fingering held double, which is like this, this red right here, um, or a DK or worsted weight. And it's fun. I like it. It's easy to do. It's, it's an easy mindless knit, but it's outgrown two bags so far. And now it's in my, my uh, fat squirrel bag um, from SSK, um, the Super Summer Knit Together Retreat last year. <laughs> And it may outgrow this one soon, and that might be the biggest bag I have, so I'm going to have to start putting it in big grocery bags or something. So that has been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Um, if you have been interested in learning how to crochet, um, I think that's a, an, easy, an easy pattern to start with. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend it. Um, let's see, my next one is the Mother Dai, which is the hap by... Um, Kate Davies, and I'm doing all of this in fern fibers, alpaca yarn, um, matter dyed and undyed. Um, I think it's just going to be gorgeous and have a really nice drape to it. So if I have a skein, I think I have a skein that is not um, wound up into a ball, and I'll talk to you a little bit about drape. But I think, let's see, I have... 71 repeats of this lace pattern and I've done I think maybe 12 now no there's got to be a few more than that but it's getting there I probably added five or six to it since I last talked to you and it's getting easier um, it's not like it's a hard pattern at all it just takes thinking so if I'm sitting down watching something with my husband or I'm listening to a podcast I'll often find that I've messed up and then I'm like oh where did I mess up and I have to you know tink back a bunch to try and figure it out because somehow I don't have the right number of stitches or something um, so it's one that takes a little more thought but as soon as this border is done it's picking up stitches and just knitting basically in the round all the way to the center so I think it's going to be it's going to go much more quickly I just got to get through the border and I can't it's going to be so soft I mean this it's pure alpaca and so squishy and drapey so I think it's going to be a beautiful blanket I'd like to have it done by winter um, the next thing I've been working on is the socks um, just a vanilla sock that I'm doing in the um, the plant printed, botanically printed sock blanks that I've been selling. And I put a few rows on that too. Let's see, that's where I was last time. Not a whole lot. Um, this is probably the most mindless knit, but I've been wanting to get those bigger ones done. This is the smallest project I have right now. I only have four projects on the needle, which is a lot for me because I usually don't have more than a couple. Um, but this is the smallest. I've got a hap, a blanket, and a large um, poncho kind of thing that I'm working on, excuse me, and then there's these, and these are the ones that I don't want to work on, but I could probably be done with them in a week if I just work on them, and they are from this sock blank, which I believe is pincushion flower or scabiosa and black walnut and hibiscus, so there we go, um, and the last one, so I asked you guys last time what you thought about showing design patterns as they were being worked. Because I know some designers, um, some designers hold off until the final release, don't even show you a picture of what it looks like if you're going to be test knitting. Um, and it's a big surprise. And I know that some will show you the whole way along. And I understand both. I guess I'm not making my living doing this. Uh, it's something I do to enjoy and if I felt like I was worried that someone would steal the pattern or um, I mean I guess that was the only the only reason that I would hold it secret and even still if I'm putting it on the podcast you guys are seeing it it's obvious that it's out there if someone else comes out with the same th thing it's going to be known that the pattern was stolen and I'm really not worried about that um, but I love being a part of the process with other designers who are like here's the yarn I've chose I'm, I'm starting a new shawl um, 
here's the swatch I'm thinking of using. You know, I'm, I like being a part of that. So, so I want to share that with you guys. I have um, one project on the needles right now, design that I'm working on, and then one that I'm going to be starting that is potentially going to be in a magazine, so I won't be able to show you that one. But, um, but this one I can show you. This is the one that I talked about um, episodes back how I was wanting to do something for my mother. She, um, I want to knit her something, but she spends a lot of the cold part of winter down in Florida. After the holidays, she always heads down to Florida and stays there for six, seven weeks. So she doesn't need a lot of heavy wool. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll design a nice poncho style thing um, out of linen. So I am, I picked a pattern and started working it and I just, I didn't, it didn't click. So I thought I'd do it myself. So this is um, Quince and Company Sparrow in the Nanny Berry colorway, I think. And here it is so far. It is going to be a long rectangle. You can kind of see the lace pattern that's coming out. There'll be a lace pattern along the bottom and along the side, and then at the final top. And then it will be folded in half and seamed except for one spot where the head goes. So it will end up being a square in the front and the back and will kind of go over like this, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I'm getting there. I think I'm about two thirds of the way through. Um, I'm not a fan of purling and I have a lot of purling to do with this. So that's what's um, making it feel kind of like a slog, but it's going faster and faster, especially the closer I get to being done. I'm really excited to see it put together. And this yarn, once it's, if, if you guys have not worked with linen before, um, the more you wash it, the softer it gets and the more it seems to bloom. So it will still be a very lacy shawl, um, or very open, not shawl, poncho, I guess you'd call it. It'll still be very open, but it's going to really fill out the spaces a lot, and I think it's going to be really beautiful. Um, I'm also thinking of doing one in the same pattern. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do this all stockinette stitch or if I'm going to knit the whole thing on the right side and the wrong side and see how that looks. I kind of wanted to just do that because that would be faster. But I'm going to do it in um, Fern Fibers. Um, this is the Seven Sisters base, which is alpaca, silk, and linen. And so this is what I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about drape. You can tell this is going to drape because of the way it flops. It does not have a whole lot of structure. If you take, um, if you take a skein of yarn and you hold it and it's strong and stiff, that's not going to be one that that has a nice drape to it. It will be, it will be um, stiffer, basically in that it'll hold its shape better. So those are really nice for sweaters that you don't want to sag. Um, drapey yarn is really nice for shawls and um, slouchy hats. Um, so yeah, both of these, this one and, do I have a skein? I do. And this one, see how they both just kind of flop over? They're, they're gonna drape and hang well in a poncho or a shawl like that. So, um, so there you go. That is going to be called my Claire pattern. And I hope to have it out sometime in August. I had hoped to have it out in July because it would have been nice to have it for the end of summer so people could knit it for the warm weather. But, um, you know, it just hasn't happened yet. And I do, oh, I will probably be asking for test knitters sometime soon. Um, I don't think it's going to take me that much longer, and it's a fairly simple pattern. I just like, I like to knit the patterns as I write them out and um, figure out the details as I go. That's kind of how I design. I know some designers can write the whole pattern out and then sit down and knit it, but I like to um, write it as I go. And then I feel like, for me, if I get to a point that I hadn't visualized <laughs> beforehand, I can actually work it out in the knitting um, instead of trying to write it all out and figure out the mathematics beforehand. So anyway, if anyone is interested in test knitting that, let me know. I'm interested in having it test knit in linen, but also it would be neat to see it done in um, a wool or a wool blend. 
or even a heavier weight yarn to see if it's something that um, instead of being so open and lacy, it could be a winter poncho. So let me know if you might be interested and that might be coming up soon. So that's it. I think as far as, far as my works in progress, um, I may get a couple of those done in the next couple of weeks. We'll see. I haven't done any spinning. I know a few episodes ago, I started spinning on the camel fiber that I got from the local farm. Um, and it's really soft, but it's driving me nuts. <laughs> it's not hard to spin, but there's so much little pieces of dirt in there that I couldn't get out. I ran it through the dump carter four times and every time we get a pile of stuff, it was just a lot dirtier than I realized. Um, so as I spin, if I don't stop every couple of inches to pull out the pieces of dirt, um, it's just going to be full of junk and I'm not going to want to knit with it. So I think I'm going to put that aside. I wanted to spin something that was just fun and easy. Um, so I decided to wash up some of the fleece that I got that I showed you. Oh, leaf is up. You want to okay. So he's all set for the morning. Um, so I washed up some of the fleece that I got at Maryland Sheep and Wool and after the Hog Island and the California Red. I didn't do all of it, um, honestly, because I didn't feel like having the whole fleece to wash. I just pulled off a part enough to explore with it and spin a little bit. The California Red, I'm realizing now probably would have better, but would have been a better idea to flick open the ends of the locks before washing it because I put it in the water um maybe a couple of a couple of ounces four ounces maybe um and there wasn't a ton of vegetable matter or dirt but the the ends of the locks had some dirt on them and they were just staying closed so I ended up taking them you know a little bit at a time and kind of rinsing them under the water to try and get them to open up and let out some of the dirt but in doing that I felt it a little bit not a lot but enough that it was kind of a pain in the butt to put it through the carter um, but what I have here is, this is what it looks like let's see if I can get it so where it's not so blown out it's big and fluffy and you can see little bits of red in it um, and I think I got out most of the chunks, so it should spin up fairly smoothly. Let me see if I can put it up close to where you can see it. Oh. Yeah, so I will start on that. It's, it's not as it's going to be a rustic yarn. I can tell by feeling it. Um, it's hard to tell sometimes when you feel a fleece, it might feel so soft sometimes because of the lanolin, lanolin that's in it or the area you're feeling it or whatever. Um, and then when you finally get ready to spin it, it's like, Oh, this is a little more, more, uh, itchy than I thought, but I still think it's going to be a really beautiful yarn and I'm excited actually to put some color on it. I think that will dye up very nicely. The other one that I'm really excited about spinning and probably what I'll do first is the hog island fleece. This though, it was very dirty. Um, when I, I had to, you know, rinse it three or four times before the water even looked slightly clear, it just had a lot of dirt. Um, but not, vegetable matter if that makes sense it was it didn't have a ton of junk in it but it was dirty um, it didn't have locks at the end that were chunked together so it opened up really well and went through super fast in the carter and um, I tried braiding some of it but <laughs> I ended up um, I put this through the carter and then I pulled it through what's called a diz just to see if I could make a roving out of it but I don't know how to do that very well <laughs> so it kind of came out chunky but Wow, it's so squishy. And there's so much crimp in this that I think it's going to be really easy to spin. It's just going to spin itself, basically, because um, it'll keep wanting to grab onto itself. But yeah, this is really beautiful. It's turned, it's, I think it's going to turn out a nice gray, though there's some specks of black and brown in there and a little bit of white. I think it's going to be really beautiful. So there's that, and I have some more in the bag. So maybe in the next couple of weeks I can get at least one of those on the wheel and do a little playing. I'm excited about that. I just haven't, I just haven't 
felt the urge to spin as much lately. There's been so much knitting and dyeing going on. So, um, so let me talk to you about the dyeing. Um, if you follow my Instagram, you'll see, you will have seen that there's been a bunch of posts about that. I did, I had some friends ask me to dye up some big square silks for tarot cards. Um, I spoke in the past about my great grandmother and how she read palms and read tarot. And I had talked with, um, a lot of my um, cousins and aunts and great aunts and there's really no one to teach it anymore no one's wanting to so I'm taking a class with a friend and just finished actually the first level class and it's been a lot of fun and really interesting I'm um, I'm enjoying learning the cards and how they relate to one another and um, just how it all works my scientific brain likes figuring it out <laughs> um, but it's really neat to just you know try and connect with my intuition a little bit more too but in the class um, some of the other students asked if I would dye some, do some eco printing on some silks. And so I did that and love how they turned out. They're really beautiful. And um, I did that a couple of weeks ago and then also did a lot of sock blanks. I'll be putting those in the store. I'm not sure if it's going to be tonight, Friday night or Saturday morning, but they'll, they'll be in there probably when this goes up. Um, and I've got a bunch and I've got a bunch more to do because I know that people really seem to be enjoying them. So I want to get a lot out there for you guys. Um, and I'll put up some pictures of the variety. I've been doing a lot of different techniques to try and get different color and, um, and different variety on them. And now is a really good time to do it because there's so much in the yard that can be printed with. So that's been a lot of fun. One thing, um, oh, and if you do knit with the sock blanks, I have put them up on Ravelry now. So you can, if you make keep project pages, you can link to the uh, Ninja Chickens yarn, which is just the sock blanks. There's either the plain or the sparkle variety. So, um, so you can link those up if you wanted to. Um, one thing that I've run into and other people have asked is how long do you wait before you unbundle your, your prints? So, um, you'll put the plants on your fiber, whatever, fiber you're using and then you roll it up either you know bundle it to itself or roll it around a pipe or a piece of um, a twig or something like that and then you either steam or simmer it some people will unwrap it as soon as it's cool to the touch some people went on will wait 24 hours some people will wait until it's completely dry um, some cultures I think it's the Japanese culture says you have to wait so many months um, for certain prints um, so I thought I'd do a little test because I want to know why. <laughs> Is there really going to be more color if you wait, you know, overnight versus when it, till it's dry versus a month? So I did three tests of the exact same plants on the exact same fiber. I put them around the same PVC pipe. I steamed them all at the same amount of time. Like I tried to take out any variables. This one was unwrapped as soon as it cooled. So we've got a little eucalyptus, there's some black walnut, there's a maple leaf, and then the black walnut printed again on the back, and then some marigold. And this is on a uh, silk noil fabric that was mordanted with alum. This was unwrapped a couple days later when it was completely dry. So you've got your eucalyptus, 
see all of it the same. So here they are next to each other. Really very little difference. So I have another one right here wrapped up that I will unwrap um, mid-August and that will have sat for a month. It's completely dry at this point so um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that it would change color once it's dried. I guess if I were to have wrapped it around um, a branch or a copper pipe or something like this is pretty inert but if it's wrapped around a branch that has tannins in it, then the tannins might change it a little bit more over time. Um, I don't know, but we'll see. We'll see how this one looks and then we'll compare and then I'll know that it's okay to unwrap everything as soon as it's cool because I don't like to wait. Um, all right, let's see. I told you there was a lot to do with eco printing. Um, I did some napkins too. I'm not sure if I'm going to put those in the store or not. I really like the idea of giving a set of four napkins to people as holiday gifts. Um, I need to really throw them through the washer a few times and make sure that the color stays. And I want to do those more with uh, a soy mordant and not alum because if people are going to be putting them to their mouth and wiping their hands with them over and over again, I'd rather it be as natural as possible. Um, Let's see. So I also was, I, I put the, I talked about it in the last episode, the moon, um, the polycarbonate moon phase blocks, resent, uh, resist print um, blocks that I have. And those are up in the store now also. There's the set of the moon phases and then there's a slightly larger crescent moon that are both up in the store. And um, I really like how those are turning out. I've been doing it a bunch. The man who, my neighbor who originally made me the first set of wooden blocks, I wanted to make him something as a thank you and I knew that he wouldn't wear it. So he's asked if I would make something for his wife. So I made her this. It's a, a silk scarf with the moon phases on it. Um, she loves purple. So I thought that would be nice. This is logwood. And originally I actually dyed the whole thing with Saxon blue. And let me see, there's some where you can still see a little of it. Can you see some of the blue in that moon? Maybe just the tiniest bit. Um, the whole thing was a beautiful pale sky blue. And then I put the blocks on so that the blue would resist in those spots. And then I put it in logwood. And it turned out beautifully, just like this, except that the moons were slightly blue. And then when I finally rinsed and ironed it, the blue disappeared. And it didn't wash out, but Saxon blue is an extract that seems to be, it's a liquid extract that's an indigo that's been altered so that you can print it, you can, you can dye with it without having to um, deoxygenate it. So you can use it similarly to a standard extract. Um, However, it's really heat sensitive. And if you have it in the dye pot, everything looks gorgeous. It's nice and blue. And then you go a little too high on the heat for too long. The blue disappears. So the only thing I could say, I didn't rinse it in a hot. I mean, I could put my hands in the water. It was less hot than when I put it in the dye bath with the logwood. And it didn't disappear then. Um, and it didn't look like it disappeared when I ironed it, but for some reason, once I rinsed it out and hung it up, it was gone. So the only thing I can think of is, um, is that maybe the ironing was too hot. I don't know. Um, but either way, I still like it and I think it's turned out beautifully and hopefully she will really like it. It's a nice size. I used the, um, crepe silk instead of the habotai, habotai silk. I just, I don't know, it feels a little more sturdy to me, and um, so I thought I'd use that, but I think she'll like it, and I think it turned out beautifully. Um, so let's see, I want to make sure I've covered everything about the, the, the eco printing and the dyeing. There was a lot to tell you guys about. So the last thing that I wanted to tell you about, and I'm super excited about this, this is I finished my bed sheets. So I don't remember... I think I was talking with 
um, Justine of The Wild Diary and Rebecca Desnos, who is another um, botanical printer and natural dyer. And there was a discussion about the, um, the effects of wearing naturally dyed clothing and if the plants could have an effect on your health. And um, I know I've mentioned this before in the podcast and it completely makes sense to me. There's energetic healing, there's flower essences, there's um, homeopathic medicine. There's all this medicine that people have used throughout the ages relating to not just ingesting a plant, but how the, the subtle energies of the plant can help with healing. So I thought, well, gosh, not just wearing um, fabric, but wouldn't it be nice to sleep on fabric like that? So I got the, I got some um, organically grown cotton. Um, I got uh, cotton sheets and I mordanted them with a soy milk that I made from soy that was non-GMO. Like I tried, I went all out with it to try and make sure that it was as, as sustainable and good for the environment and good for us as possible. Um, and then I dyed the top sheet in birch bark and apple bark that was from a couple of trees that came down earlier this year. And I printed plants along the top where you'll pull it up to your neck. Then I dyed the bottom sheet with turmeric. Um, my husband loves yellow and I thought that would be a really pretty color, a nice deep golden yellow. And um, I dyed the pillowcases with lavender and elderberries from the land and with the moon phases on them. And we slept in them for the first time last night because I just finished them yesterday. And it, they're so beautiful. I mean, it. It's nice to crawl into some really pretty sheets and just relax. The pillowcases do still smell like lavender, which is nice. Um, and, and the funny thing is that Maxine, who's probably the most skittish and least snuggly of the cats, as soon as I sat down in bed last night, I was watching some podcasts and knitting, she jumped up, the, up there and meowed and meowed and meowed and rolled around on my legs and was just like loving it. It was really, really sweet. And she slept on the bed all last night. Um, so I think she enjoyed the, um, uh, herbal medicine in the sheets too. So, um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I would encourage you guys to try it if you think it might be something you'd enjoy, even if it's just the bottom sheet or the top sheet, you know, um, yeah, I'm excited to go to bed again tonight because it was nice to sleep in them. It smelled good. So um, I'll put some pictures up. It was hard to get, it was really hard to get good pictures of those because um, with all the wood in our house, over time it has yellowed a bit and everything looks very yellow and there's a lot of shadows. That's why I do a lot of podcasting outside. But I, I was also standing on a chair to try and take a better picture from above. And... Um, and as I stepped off the chair, I had lots of space to make it to the ground, but I forgot that there's one little part of our bed that sticks out. Um, the bed has two posts kind of holding up the frame. Um, and I stepped on the post and I was expecting to hit the ground a foot later. And um, I don't think I broke it, but I hurt my foot. <laughs> so I've been hobbling around a bunch, um, but it was a good, reason to put my feet up last night and just relax. So, um, so yeah, the hazards of photography. Um, so that's it for all the natural dyeing. Like I said, there's lots of stuff in the store. There's silks and, and the moon blocks already in there and there will be some sock blanks in there by the time this goes out. Um, so the next thing is I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, acquisitions. I, I think it was in my third or fourth episode, talked about a company called Pichinku, which is, a, um, which was started by a woman who lives in Peru, Cusco, Peru, and was trying to help a group of artisans with their, their business, their natural dyeing and stuff. And she and some women got together and started a naturally dyed yarn business using the traditional methods and plants from their area and using alpaca and wool from their area. So I thought it was a really sweet way to support global community um, as 
Mars from Hay Brownberry calls it, the connection of global community. I mean, yes, I'm all about support local in my own community, but I also feel like in this day and age, we need to be a global community. And um, so I was very excited to be able to support her and I got my Kickstarter yarn, which is gorgeous. So here are the three colors. This is Nogal, which looks a lot to me like black walnut, um, but I don't know if that's what it is or not because these are the native names. And it even has who it was dyed by, which is pretty cool. This is Terra, which is a beautiful purple. Here's the label so you can see it a little better. Pichinku. And this is Koole. which is a lovely yellow that reminds me of turmeric. Um, she has opened the store this morning, actually. She, the, the yarn was officially released this morning. I got wool. Um, so see, drape-wise, it stands straight up. Not much of a drape. <laughs> These are good examples. So this is going to be a sturdy garment. It's not going to be as flowy, um, which I think this would make a gorgeous sweater um, or a nice hat but I would love to put these colors in a colorwork sweater. But yes, I got the wool option. There was wool and alpaca, and I, um, I love alpaca. I think it's fabulous, but I really like wool for garments, so I decided to go with this. It's a, um, a single ply. I think the alpaca is a two ply. But Pichinku, P-I-C-H-I-N-K-U, their store is open as of this morning. So, um, I, I would highly recommend you check it out because I think it's a fabulous cause, fabulous job, or um, a fabulous business, that's what I'm trying to say. My other acquisition came also from overseas. Um, I did a trade with Nathan of Twisted Finch. He's a yarn dyer over in the UK, and um, I sent him one of my sock blanks in exchange for some of his yarn. And um, he was sweet enough to send me two skeins of yarn. And I really liked his sky dye base, which is this gorgeous yellow. And the funny thing is, like, if you were to ask me what's my least favorite color, it would probably be orange and yellow. <laughs> but I love this kind of yellow and this kind of yellow, like that, I guess it's like the natural kind of yellow. These look like naturally dyed skeins. It's um, like the colors you can get from turmeric, I guess. It's deep, it's golden, it's, um, it's a solid color, if that makes sense. It feels grounding. So I really love these, here's his label. Twisted Finch. This is his Merino Cashmere Nylon base, and this one, it's a fingering weight, and this one is um, his DK weight, uh, which is just Merino. And I'm super excited to put these in something. I don't know, I wonder, this is definitely more of a worsted or bulky. But yeah, they might even go together. We'll see. So those are the two things that I ended up getting. Um, and I, again, I would highly recommend you check both of them out. I think they're beautiful um, yarns. And if you haven't looked at his Instagram feed, Twisted Finch, he has a really beautiful, a really good eye for beautiful colors and putting them together and um, does some beautiful dyeing. So yeah, those are the two things that I got. Um, I also received a couple weeks ago uh, a shawl from uh, Pippernell. She has, um, or Pippernell, she has a podcast, but also um, is a designer, a new designer, and she sent me her sand bloom shawl, which is absolutely beautiful. And I'd like to put it in a giveaway, so I'm going to try and think of something, and maybe in the next couple of um, episodes, we'll put together a giveaway for you guys, so you can see the shawl and um, maybe have some nice yarn. I'll figure it out. But um, yeah, so I think that's it as far as fiber and dyeing goes. I did want to give you guys an update on the bee swarm that I talked about last time. Um, 
so we had gotten all the bees into one box and there was still a swarm that was on the tree and we couldn't figure out why they wouldn't go into the box. Turns out there was at least two queens and I didn't know this could happen. So generally with a swarm, the original hive starts feeling like it's full and that part of them, like they don't have enough room. So they start developing a queen cell, which, and it may be more than one, there may be six or seven queen cells in the hive. They feed specific bees royal jelly, which makes them turn into genetically a queen bee, a larger bee, a bee that's programmed to, you know, lay eggs, that kind of thing. And, um, it's quite, and so usually when that first new queen hatches, the worker bees will kill the other cells so that there's only one queen. She stays and the older queen flies off with a crew and to find another home. So you have the new queen there. She'll go out, take her mating flight and mate with some of the drone bees and then come back and, um, and start laying in the old hive. Well, it seems like what might have happened is that at least two queens hatched. Um, a queen, a new queen, two new queens, one of them stayed with the hive, and then another one flew off with the old queen, and they separated. They, like, they, they flew off, they swarmed together, and then after they landed, they kind of separated into their own crew. So we ended up having two boxes, two new hives. But when my friend Carl, who works the bees, when he went back into the hives, the six original hives, he said, they're all really full. I don't see how that large of a hive could have left or a large of a swarm could have left these hives. So, um, so it's possible they came from somewhere else. There's a lot of beekeepers around here. It's possible that the swarm came from someone out somewhere else and maybe they smelled these hives, smelled the honey and thought, oh, this will be a good place to land and find a home. Um, but we'll see once he goes into the two original, he lets them settle for a little bit and start making brood and, and gathering things before really disturbing them so they don't fly off again or kill the new queen or whatever. Um, once he goes into them, he's gonna let me know if he sees an old queen and if she's been marked. A lot of beekeepers will mark their queens with a little dot of paint and their specific colors depending on, you know, what, um, what, who the beekeeper is. So Carl marks his with a specific color. And if it's not that color, then he knows it was not from our hives. So it was all pretty cool and a lot to learn about and really neat to, um, to see them swarming. And a few people comment about how I, I was very brave to stand there by all the bees. When they were initially flying around and trying to find a spot to land, I was standing near enough that they were flying past, but generally they're, they're pretty, calm when they're swarming. Once they had landed and Carl was out trying to get them into boxes, I was sitting in the car and I was filming from inside the car with the windows up. So I'm not that brave. <laughs> I had everything going. At one point, my husband walked behind the car and was standing there. And I heard, I heard Leaf come out of the house and go, where's mom? And my husband goes, I don't know. And I was like, I'm in the car. He didn't even see me in there. I was sitting in there with my camera, but it was really cool because I, I was able to get some shots of bees that landed on the, um, on the window and they were giving themselves a little bath. Um, so yeah, that was fun. So let's see what else is going on. Summer's already over halfway done. <laughs> It goes by so fast. Every year at the beginning of the summer, we write down our bucket list of the things we really want to get done. The things that will make us feel like summer's complete, like playing in a waterfall or going roller skating or having a picnic, just something. Um, and I don't think we've checked off more than like two things on that list. It just always gets so busy and full, which is fine. I mean, it gets full with, you know, going to the library and watching movies together, or playing out at the swing or, working, you know, but, um, one of the things that we are looking forward to at the end of the summer is that Kaya is going to be starting a school. I've homeschooled until now, and this is technically a homeschool high school, but I'm really excited about it. She's had a hard time the past couple of years with being a part of a bigger community. She has her closest friends. Um, a lot of people, when they hear homeschooling think, oh, they'll be socially awkward. You know, they don't have, they don't hang out with their peers and that's totally not true. Um, there is a good supportive community that Kaya gets to be a part of, but she's at home more often than students that go to school, you know, eight hours a day. Um, 
And I don't know about you, but I don't think sending myself to public school made me not socially awkward. I think, I think she's probably less socially awkward than I was and I went to school, you know, a public school. Um, so anyway, over the past couple of years, she's expressed a lot how she wants to spend more time with her friends, but her closest friends live between 30 and 45 minutes away. So it's hard to get that to happen. We've, we've done book clubs and we've done, um, role playing game groups and stuff to make sure that they have some kind of connection. And sometimes they take classes together, but this school that is opening, um, the elementary school has been established and the middle school has been established, but they are opening a new high school and it's a flexible high school. So it's open to, um, students that homeschool, um, or students that want to go there full time. There's only one class that they have to be in, that everybody needs to be in. And that's the class. It's a history class, but it also does music and art and community development. Like there's a, there's a lot in that class. And that's the only one that everybody needs to be part of. So technically she could take that and nothing else. But there's gonna be a math class. There's gonna be a science class. There's gonna be um, language arts and all of that. So she'll be taking a few of those classes. Um, and one of the things that they're doing, it's combined actually, they're doing some, um, something called culture club, which is every, either every trimester or however long the kids decide they want to work on it. They'll work on, they'll learn about it, culture and, um, and learn the, some of the language, learn the history, learn about that area and then raise money to take a trip there, which I think would be amazing. And they've chosen France, which is going to be super cool because Kai has been learning French. She wants to go there. So they're already planning the trip for next year. And it happens to coincide with another thing that they do that's part of their um, community service project called Peace Jam. And I think it's just peacejam.org. Um, but you can look it up. And it's, a, it's a program where the kids will learn about the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, um, Nobel Peace Prize winners, read read their stories, learn about what they've been doing and figure out how to apply some of this in their own community. So they will create a service project in their community to better the community, which in itself I think is amazing. But every year Peace Jam has an international meetup where people who can come will come and talk about what, what they've done for their community and, um, and meet some of the Nobel Peace Prize winners. So this year, this coming year, 2018, it happens to be in France. So they're planning on going to do that. And Desmond Tutu is going to be the, the, um, the peace Nobel peace prize winner. Who's going to be there at the meetup. So it's all like all the cards are falling into place. It's going to be absolutely amazing for her. And I'm so excited for her. She's nervous, you know, starting a school, wondering if she'll want to be around these kids, wondering what kind of workload there's going to be. But one of the really big components of this school is that they want the kids to be a part of it, a part of the development, a part of the foundation to build the school. And so they've asked them things like, well, what hours do you want? And unanimously, the kids said, we don't want to start at eight. So the school starts at 10. Um, and, and they've shown them the different curriculum that they're thinking of using and had the kids say, yeah, this one does not look good to me, but that looks pretty good, you know? And so they're, they're really getting to be a part of it and with the guidance of these mentors. And so I'm really excited about that. One thing that Kaya won't be doing there is her science curriculum. She had an environmental and earth science class this past year in the eighth grade, and that's what's generally covered in the ninth grade. So she doesn't need to do that. So instead she's asked if I would teach her herbal medicine. And I'm so excited. She, um, she's expressed a little interest before, but not like, I want to learn this. And it's something that I really want to pass on to my kids. I want them to have that knowledge <clears throat> just for their own safety and sake, because it's good knowledge to have. And so, um, she wants to know a lot about medicine making. So for the nine months of the school year, we're probably going to focus on, um, what's out in the gardens, learning about those, but also how to, how to put them together and why they are good for, you know, this one's good for cuts and this one's good for bruises and that one's good for colds and stuff like that. And we're probably actually going to use a curriculum through my friend Juliet, who is, um, Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. 
she has recently put out two curriculum. One is a medicine making curriculum and one is a, a longer intensive. And the medicine making one I think would fit perfectly into, you know, a nine, ten month curriculum. And that'll have some structure for me so I don't have to rewrite the whole thing. But we can watch a video, we can learn about salve and tincture making and then, you know, we can talk more in depth about it if we want to. So I'm excited about that. Leaf also wants to learn medicine making, so he'll probably join us. So that was a lot, <laughs> but I'm super excited about the school and the possibilities for Kaya and the future possibilities for Leaf. I could certainly teach her through high school if she wanted me to, but I feel like this is a place where she can really develop a stronger community and be with them more often and branch out a little bit. You know, she's at the age where she needs to step outside of the home and experience being responsible for her own decisions a little bit more. So that's that. I think that's everything. I don't have a tea for you today. Um, I should have made some turmeric tea with all the turmeric dye I had left over. There was nothing in it but turmeric and soy milk mordant. But, um, but yeah, I will think of something. Maybe since the elderberries are coming in, we'll do something with elderberries next time. Have a fabulous next couple of weeks. I appreciate you all coming in um, and saying hi. And I will hopefully talk to you soon. Bye-bye. If that mockingbird wants in, Papa's in a